Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, I've got a, a couple of flies that I'll tie for you tonight that are both nymph patterns. Um, they're from a couple of different books. The first one is from get it down here for some place where you can see it. It's called Tying and Fishing the Fuzzy Nymph by Polly Roseboro. Um, and this first fly is called the Casual Dress. Um, it's, uh, it's probably become one of my most favorite flies, and part of what I like about it is its simplicity. Um, it has two materials. It has muskrat fur and it has ostrich fur. Um, and I do tie it in a couple of different variations. You can see in the vise, the, this is the traditional style uh, tied out of muskrat. But I also tie it using fox. So I tie that on a larger size hook. Uh, the fox is much longer than the muskrat is. And I substitute a, a, a black um, uh, hackle, fire, uh, hackle uh, wrap for the black ostrich because the proportions needs to be bigger. Um, I also tie it out of um, Australian possum, which makes a fuzzier version of the same thing. But all of these fish very nicely, and I, I probably should have taken the opportunity to wet one of these for you. Um, you know, it just looks kind of like a scraggly bunch of hair when it's tied, but when that is in the water and is you know, fished is kind of a, a, a streamer pattern. It, it is a perfect memo, uh, imitation of a minnow. Uh, the ostrich fur is fairly soft in nature and it just pulsates in the water when you stop. And uh, I found that our local bluegills and little smallmouth bass and everything just can't resist this pattern. So. I uh, typically, when we head out someplace to fish in the Trinity or in the Brazos, I'll always start with this as one of my flies um, in trying to see what's working. So with no further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to tie this on a little bigger hook than what I probably normally tie it on just for the purpose of being able to see what I'm doing. Um, it does have, I think, some interesting techniques, and I've got to get through it. Hard to tie these patterns without using thread. Um, I'm also using a fairly heavy thread. This is uh, uh, Danville Flat Wax 210 denier. Um, on this one, it'll be in black. And the reason I tie that with um, a heavier thread is when I get to the collar, I'm actually going to split the thread, insert the fur into the split in the thread, and tie that on as a collar. Seems like there's always something that you forget to put out. Yes, they are. Oh, uh, it was his dog, but he had a heart attack earlier today. <laughs> Le Lejan pointed to some things I have on the floor down here. Um, I'll actually show you. Here is the muskrat, muskrat fur. Barry, I think if you showed in front of the hook, this side of the hook. This side of the hook? Yeah. yeah. This is a muskrat fur, and you can see it's a whole cased muskrat. 
Um, I get these online from a place called Glacierware, and it, you can buy this. Barlow's, I know, has patches of this. They're about two inch squares. Um, they tend not to be quite as nice a hair as this, and they're like uh, seven or eight bucks for a two inch square, and this is $13.95 for a whole pelt, which is, that's good for probably, uh, I don't know, a thousand uh, casual dresses or so. Now, I'll, I'll pass that around. And I also have the Australian possum that I tie a variant out of. And I have a red fox pelt that I yeah, use to tie like coat. to yeah, tie like a coat. coat. Yeah, they're, they're nice, nice pelts. All of those are from Glacier Wear at different prices, but they have very attractive prices on things. All right. Uh, what animal was the second one? Australian possum. Possum. I apologize. I'm going to be shifting glasses. I had. Uh, eye surgery um, last Tuesday and uh, my normal prescription no longer works so I've got to do some moving around of glasses to be able to see. Okay, um, I do put some lead wraps on the uh, casual dress. Um, I like it to sink a little bit, and so I'm just going to put, um, you know, 15 or 20 lead wraps on there. This is the uh, .020 lead wire. Uh, you could certainly use heavier. That just happened to be the spool of lead that I grabbed. Okay, so we've got that on there, and now I'll start in with my thread wraps, and I'm going to create a thread dam behind that. We can go ahead and clip the tag end off. Can I borrow your scissors a minute? <laughs> I, I know how much fur were in those when they left my possession, so I will be checking. Yeah, there must be a moss in the room. <laughs> Bunch of scavengers in here. Okay, so I'm just going to apply some thread wraps over the top of that. Now, as I mentioned, um, this is a fairly simple pattern from the material standpoint, uh, maybe not so much from the techniques, but I'm just going to grab a pinch of the muskrat, including the underfur, and I'm going to clip that off from the hide. And I'm going to grasp those long guard furs in my fingers and strip out a bunch of the under fur. Now, if you were only tying one or two of these, this becomes your body dubbing. The fur that you strip out from under there becomes your body dubbing. Um, I do them so much, I go ahead and blend some up. But I'm going to attach that to the body. And I'm going to go right to where the bend starts and attach that on the body. And you can see it makes a nice full tail on there. Um, Jerry, if you don't have muskrat, what else could you use? You could do it with rabbit. Um, the challenge with using rabbit is the guard hairs on rabbit aren't nearly as long as they are on muskrat or the possum or the fox. But you could certainly do it with rabbit than I have. You just got to be a little more careful when you're putting the tail together and also the collar because those long guard hairs play a real important role in giving it the streamlined look. So I have some, this is muskrat fur and I've actually added, you can see there's a little sparkle that I've added in there just because I like the look that it gives the body. Um, the original from Mr. Rosenberg's book did not have that. Uh, just an addition that I've made that I kind of think adds a little bit to the look. Fish probably don't care. And I'm just going to dub a 
table <coughs> body using this muskrat fur. And I'm going to go up to about the two thirds point. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. That, the thread looks like it was splitting. Is, are you using like a wax? This is 210 flat wax oh, okay. danville. Right, I am going to split it when I get to the collar. I'm not splitting it now. Okay. I'm simply just dubbing this on there. <coughs> And one thing you'll find out about the muskrat is it dubs about as well as anything I've found. It's just just a dream to dub with because it just wraps around so nicely. Okay, and so I built that body up and you can see it's real buggy and you could come in and brush that out with a Velcro brush or something if you wanted to be more buggy. But what happens when this gets wet? You've got the tail section that streamlines down. You have a collar section that is a cone out over the front of it, and that cone wraps around and makes a nice silhouette, and so you don't really see much of the underbody. So my recommendation was don't spend a ton of time uh, on the underbody. I do like to make it kind of torpedo-shaped in there so it has a tapered abdomen. Um, and in the book, Mr. Rosenborough has a really interesting technique for applying the body. He builds something called a dubbing noodle. And the way that he does that, you know, see if I can do this for people that are watching on the camera. He, he creates a little wad of dubbing in his hands and he simply runs his hands back and forth and he creates a dubbing noodle. He ties that in and then ties that around and wraps it around the body. But what I found is that is not very durable at all. It, it comes apart the first time a fish hits it and so I do it slightly different. I actually just do a traditional dub body on there. But this next step is uh, kind of an interesting step. I'm going to use a Swiss CDC clamp, and it's nice because it has this nice pointed edge, and I can reach into a section of fur, and I have, I have some muskrat down here on the table, and I'm just going to grab some of that with the... CDC clamp and take my scissors in and cut it loose from the um, hank of hair just like that and I'm going to use my fingers to kind of spread that out a little bit make a nice long what is going to be a uh, dubbed collar but I just kind of spread that out and then I'm going to take a bodkin, and this is the reason I'm using this 210 veneer. I'm just going to sit here and take my bodkin and stroke that thread back so it's flattening out. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I can insert the bodkin into the thread, maybe. And it, the more you work that, the flatter it'll get. You can see how I have it spread out on my finger. And then I'm going to insert my finger into the thread that I split out with the bodkin. I'm going to take the Swiss CDC clamp and put it inside that split thread. I'm going to release it in there. And I'm going to pull pretty hard on that thread so that it's trapped between those fibers. And then I'm going to take a whip finish tool, hold it up, and I'm going to simply spin the bobbin. And I'm going to spin that a lot. And what you'll see is I continue to spin that bobbin, that thread 
it's wrapped up in that split loop and becomes a very, very nice um, brush, if you will. And I'm going to apply that to the fly right where the, the uh, dubbing ended. And I'm going to use my fingers to preen all those fibers to the back and continue wrapping those around. And you'll see. Yeah, that's great. That that creates just a lovely, lovely collar. And I didn't do a very good job of actually got too much room up here. Um, should have been up a little further, but for purpose of time, we'll call that good. Um, and you can see that that makes a lovely cone-shaped collar that, once again, when that gets in the water and gets wet, it is just an incredible imitation. Um, do, you all, do you always dead drift this, or could you fish it as a streamer? No, I, I fish it as a streamer quite often. Okay, yeah, it looks you, like it. You can, you can certainly dead drift it, and because of the softness of the fur in here, it just kind of sits there and pulses even when it's sitting there, you know, in a dead drift. But remember, I've got a fair amount of lead wraps on there, and so it's going to tend to sink. Um, and if you're only in, you know, three or four feet of water, it's going to hit the bottom and stay there unless you've got a lot of current. And so quite often what I do is fish it just like you would a traditional streamer using, you know, small hand strips or, or sometimes big strips. Again, you know, depending on what kind of mood the fish are in, sometimes you need very small movement stripping the fly back to you. Sometimes you need, you know, exaggerated 80-inch movements on the strips. But you just, you just mess around with that and keep trying it until you find something that works. Mary, are you imitating something specific? No, um, it, it's not. Um, although, to me, when this gets wet, it, it's a dead ringer for a minnow. I mean, it looks just like a minnow tracing through the water. Uh, but it, it's, it's not a specific imitation of anything in particular. Um, but I, I, I think all the bluegills and bass think it's a minnow. Okay, so I'm going to do just a, a traditional wrap. What's that you're talking about? This is black ostrich. And for those of you who've messed around with tying Atlantic salmon flies, you know that you're looking for ostrich that is kind of medium in length and um, very well behaved and not all that fluffy. This is the place you get to use all that wild looking stuff because the bigger the barbules on the ostrich, the better it is for this particular pattern. And again, when this gets wet, it, it slicks down. Um, but that's all there is to that fly. Harry, would you please say the name of it again? It's a casual dress, and Mr. Rosenborough named it that because with it only being muskrat and ostrich, how could it be any more casual than that? <laughs> Mary, have you ever put a bead head, you ever put a bead head on that fly? I do not. Um, you, you certainly could. Um, if you look at the way this looks in the water, that ostrich hurl actually slicks back as well. And so it looks like a dark segmented head for the minnow. Um, if, if you put a bead head on it, it would, it would tend to dip as you're stripping it. Whereas I have lead wraps in the middle and it tends to just sink um, levelly. So, I, I don't put a bead on it. There's no reason you couldn't. Um, it would change the way that uh, ostrich head looks because 
by definition, you're going to be pushing it back and the ostrich is going to be behind the head. Um, the only thing I do to finish it off is just a little uh, Sally Hansen's or whatever you're... Um, sometimes I finish these with UV and that winds up being a very nice finish for it as well. But that's all there is to that fish. I'll want to, uh, that's why I'll take that and pass it around. And Jack, would you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. Go out and run that in the water fountain. Sure. So you can see what it looks like. And Barry, I have a note. Yes. Have you ever thought of putting... hang, hang on just a minute. <laughs> oh, Jim, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, have you ever thought of putting, finishing it off with red, you know, red uh, thread, just to give it a little bright? Little, little hot spot. Uh, I, I have not. Um, and, and again, the, the, the bluegills don't seem to be able to resist this, mm -hmm. so I haven't spent a lot of time trying to, you know, increase its attractiveness because it works so incredibly well the way it is. Okay, um, I'm going to switch gears, and Jack will have that back in in a second and pass it around. And you can see, um, I'll send both of them, so take both of those, one, one dry and one wet. So if any of you got to go to the entomology on the stream class, looking at it wet, it looks like a small heldermite. And the color pattern that you got on there, yep. that, I mean, we found dark helvermites, we found light colored helvermites, but it, it, I can see why the bass and the, the uh, bluegills. Yeah. I, I think it imitates a whole bunch of different things that yeah, are in there, I, and it just so buggy looking. It, it really, I mean, looking at what was in everybody's same nets yesterday, it, it does have the potential to, can to you mimic that? That's a lot. That's a lot. Looking at it as you tied it, you know, that held not very yeah. you see can all see that the, coming off of it. See yeah. the colors there on the Helgramite are almost exactly yeah, it looks a what lot we like just it. tied in there. So I hadn't I hadn't thought about that imitating a Helgramite, but yeah, looking at this burger, it sure does. Well, I, and, and looks a lot like yesterday's it. class, I wouldn't have thought of it either. But it, yep. when you were tying it, <coughs> Jack came in and showed it wet. I was like, oh. Well, I can tell you the one that you gave me when we were at the in Fort Worth, when, or Did wherever we were. Oh, uh, anyway, Did wherever you, you gave me one of those. To, 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 oh, it's in really? McKinney. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mesquite. Yeah. I used that at Jeff Gannon's place, and the bass was so big it broke my line. I tried to we I tried to force it in and took broke off my whole line. And I lost that fly. There you go. I'm going to pass this around. This is the. Polly Roseboro, and I've got, there's about three or four editions of the book um, out there, and he just changed them slightly, so, but you can find those on Amazon, and he's got like, I think, 18 different nymph patterns in there that are, that are all good. I also like one that's called the, uh, uh, the Fleeter Mouse that's out of that book that I tie quite often. Okay, let me switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to tie, and this is from the Feather Benders Fly Tying Techniques book by Barry Ord Clark. And there is a pattern in there called a burrowing mayfly. Now, I've never seen a burrowing mayfly, but apparently they're fairly common in the Northeast and in the UK, so it's a fairly well-known pattern, but um, if you look at that pattern, and I'll put it in the vise here so everybody can see what I'm talking about, um, it's just a buggy looking nymph pattern to me, and I kind of fell in love with it. Jeff, I'll pass that around. I do tie it slightly different than what he does. On his body, he just uses a dub body and then has ostrich hurl that ribs it. On mine, I actually use um, rubber legs 
and because I think it makes a slightly tougher body. But I'll get started on that. And that tail almost looks like a, a damselfly nymph tail. Yeah, it's you know the traditional three-tailed fly on there. And both of these patterns, you can tie them. Um, the the um, casual dress I tie from probably a 16, you know, 2x streamer here. Uh, all the way up through about a six, or actually the the um, the fox that I showed you on this pattern um, is tied, I think, on about a four. So I'm passing around some samples of this. You can see some variations of how I've tried the casual dress with the Australian possum. Uh, doesn't have any of the um, the, um, uh, I'm drawing away. Um, the um, muskrat. Muskrat. Thank you. Um, Senility is a terrible thing. Um, it doesn't have any of the muskrat in there. That's in those two that we're passing around separately. Uh, it also has got the burrowing mayfly, and you can see I tie it in several different colors to, you know whatever nymphs you have coming out in your local waters, you obviously tie it to try to match the watercolor. Um, I've, I've tied this a number of different ways. It also has a split collar, so I want to tie it with some heavier thread. Um, I've tied it with uh, white 210, which is very effective. You can color the head when you get up to it, but we're making the abdomen out of rubber legs and the white is quite effective as an underlayment in there. I think it gives the abdomen a little more depth um, when you get to it with the white thread under it. <coughs> I'm tying it here with uh, 210 Danville flat wax and uh, olive. So the first thing we're going to do is tie in the tail. And to do that, you take a section of ostrich in whatever color that you're tying it in. And I'm just going to go down here and get three pearls. Try to match those up as best I can so that the length is similar. And I'm just going to tie those in on top of the hook shank. Wrap up the body and clip off the tag ends. And I'm going to tie in a piece of rubber legs and in this scenario I'm using this is Fly Tires Dungeon Bug Legs and Olive. You can tie it with any kind of rubber legs I think and have basically the same effect. I'm going to go ahead and tie that in and capture it and pull that back and put it in my material keeper and we'll get back to that in a minute. I'm also going to select a nice long ostrich hurl and this will be tied in as ribbing after we tie in the bug legs for the abdomen but you've got to tie it in kind of in the reverse order that I'm going to wrap them in. And I'm now going to try to create a tapered, kind of torpedo-shaped body, just using thread wraps. And so I'm going to do this fairly hastily for the interest of everybody's sanity. 
but you do want the abdomen to be you know, smaller at the back and then get larger as it comes forward. And the only way to do that, since the bug legs are the same diameter, I will control a little bit of that by stretching the bug legs as I start out and then letting up the tension as I get towards the front. But for right now, um, that's good enough for a tapered section in there. And I'm just going to apply touching the adjacent wraps. And I am putting a little tension on this at the back. And so I'm kind of compressing that bug leg material. <clears throat> then as I come forward, I'll lighten up on my tension on that. And you can see with the combination of the thread wraps as an underbody <coughs> and the changing of the tension in the bug legs, which allows them to get fatter as I move forward. I'm not really concerned about how that looks under there because that's all going to be hidden under the wing case. Now I'm going to take that long piece of ostrich hurl and I'm trying to be careful to not disturb my three tail segments back there as I do all this, and I'm simply going to wrap this up, and the ostrich hurl, the, the actual um, rachis of the ostrich hurl kind of dives down into the segments of the bug legs, and I think helps protect it from little fishy teeth from breaking all that loose although I will do some additional protection here on that. So I've simply wrapped those up there in kind of a spiral adjacent wraps coming up the body. And now I'm going to give it a little bit of a haircut on the back because if you look at these bugs, they have gills underneath, but they have a fairly smooth uh, section on the back of the abdomen. So I'm going to take a little UV glue and just layer a little bead of UV down the back of this. And what that does is really anchors in that rachis of the uh, um, ostrich hurl in there so that when this gets chewed on by some little fishy teeth, It'll tend to stay in place rather than unraveling and stringing behind the, the uh, bug. Okay, now I'm going to take a piece of, and this could be EP fibers or whatever your uh, favorite synthetic material blend is, and I'm going to take a little segment of this, and this is. Um, Fly Tires Dungeon Water Mix. They've got about 18 different versions of this synthetic and, it, and it's EP-like fiber. Um, I, can't, I can't tell the difference between it and EP fiber. But I'm going to tie in a segment of that right here at the back of the body kind of make sure I've got that all whipped down very nicely. And then I'm just going to lay that back there for a second. I'm now I'm going to take a piece of peacock curl and depending on the quality of your peacock curl you may need one or five depending on what your peacock curl looks like. But I'm going to tie that in and I'm going to leave my thread right up against where the uh, 
wing case material is because I want to wind that back there. But I'm going to take that peacock curl and I'm going to wind a segment of thorax across there and capture that. Trim off the tag ends of that. Now I'm going to do another one of those split collars. Uh, although this is not really a collar. I guess you could describe it as a collar, but I'm going to take two fairly beefy sections of CDC, and this can be whatever color you would like for it to be. Um, I've got a contrasting color just because I chose to make it a contrasting color. You could certainly do it out of olive CDC. But I'm going to take two of those and I'm going to stroke back the fibers on both of them. And this is, once again, a lot of times you're looking for very small, you know, fluffy CDC and Sometimes you get these giant uh, pieces of CDC. This is a good use for those giant sections of CDC. And I'm going to simply take both of those pieces of CDC and lay them on top of each other so the rachis is right on top of each other. And I'm going to come up here with my Swiss CDC clamp and I'm going to grab those so that the rachis is outside of the clamp, but most of the fibers are captured by the clamp. And then I'm going to come in here with my scissors and clip all of that rachis and so I've got another side that I could use for another feather and I'm going to push those up a little bit so they stick out a little bit. I've got a, got a section of rachis still in there that I'm going to clip out. Okay, so I've got a section of CDC now captured in my Swiss clamp and I'm going to do a similar maneuver. I can find my phone connected. Hey, Barry, yes. everybody here knows this, but you might tell them what a nice piece of equipment that clamp is. Yeah. It uh, works so much better than that. The, the CDC clamp, you can, you can use a whole bunch of things. I have, um, um, Pedagene makes a set of clear clamps that do similar things, and um, there's a new company that has come out um, and I'm trying to remember who the maker is, but it's an offset set of long tweezers that do virtually the same thing. I love the CDC clamp because it's got that sharp nose on there. And like when I was doing the muskrat before, I can take that and just insert that down into the, um, the skin and peel off as much or as little of the hair as I want. I've just got really, really good control. The other thing is the spring clamp that is on this thing. Uh, when I'm using my Pedagene clear clamps, when I get it in here like that, I have to take my fingers and press on the clamp to hold pressure on it to make sure that the material doesn't come loose. With this Swiss CDC clamp, the spring on it is so strong I've never had the material move on me. So it's it's a great tool. It, it's a little pricey. Um, I think they're like 48 bucks now for one of these. But I, I use this all the time and all kinds of time and have found it to be a wonderful tool. Where, where did you get it? Uh, I think I got mine from Jay Stockard. But you there's it's it's all over the place. Any any large fly shop will tend to have them. 
I know Charlie Slybox has them. I think uh, Avid Max. Dakota Avid Dakota. Max has them. So it's not, not hard to find at all. Okay, like I did before, I'm going to use my bodkin. And this is 210 denier, so it should kind of move out here. And I, and I actually have a tool that does this. Um, and I forget who makes it. Stofno, I believe, makes a splitting tool. And it's a real cute little device that it's got um, a, a round pin that is tapered very abruptly that you can take and stick in here and split it. Um, I find the thread's got to be just right for that to work, and so I reverted back to just splitting this by hand. And, it, and it's not hard to do. If you get it flattened out on your finger, um, it's pretty easy to insert the bodkin in there and split that out. And the other thing with the CDC, it works very nicely to get in there and allow you to slip the threads off and you can kind of adjust those fibers a little bit, but you can see that they're embedded in those two uh, split threads. And I'm going to do the exact same thing as I did before. I am going to spin my bodkin, and you can't see this offline, but I've got that bodkin just spinning as kind of as, as rapidly as I can spin it. And it will eventually telegraph up through that lines and wind those two split segments back together and it it locks those fibers in there so that they will you can you can do whatever you want to to those things and they won't come out. Barry, does it matter which direction you spin it? No, it doesn't. Um, but since I'm a right hand tire, um, I'm not sure we got somebody off from? mute that the echoes coming from. Um, since I'm a right hand tire, every time I tie I introduce one clockwise turn of thread, and so I always loosen counterclockwise and tighten clockwise. But it doesn't matter because at some point you're going to spin it enough to where it goes to, you know, just straight and will start tightening the other way. So one of the advantages of, for me as a right hand tire, spinning it that way is as I start to put this on to where I'm going to apply it, it's tightening it every time I take a wrap. Whereas if I had gone the other way, if I'd spun counterclockwise, it would now be loosening it every time. Now, in this case, it's probably got 50 or 75 turns in there holding it in place. And so the five wraps that I'm going to make is not going to make a difference. So the, the short answer to your question is, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, the long answer is, yeah, it makes some difference. And in certain situations, like when I'm dubbing, I always dub um, such that I'm dubbing it on in a, in a counterclockwise way so that when it puts the thread wraps in there, it's tightening the dubbing as I apply it. So, and Barry, when do you split the thread and when do you use a dubbing loop? Or do you always split the um, thread? This it would be very difficult to do with the dubbing loop. And the reason I say that is with the dubbing loop, and, and you could probably do it, but with the dubbing loop, you're holding it open typically with, and I don't have one up here, yeah, with little tools. some kind of a tool that's got two prongs on it, and it, you put the material in there and then pull it back to right. tighten it. And so it's, it's much easier for me to just pull back on the thread to tighten it rather than having to worry. I have tried doing this with a traditional dubbing loop, and what happens to me about half the time I drop my material out because I've not held tension on it sufficient until I can get it twisted up. But you could certainly do it that way. So I'm going to do this just like I did on the collar in that I'm kind of twisting that back 
so that hopefully all the um, the fibers of the CDC are leaning towards the back and then I'm kind of going to prune that down with my hands and I'm going to take that bundle of EP fibers or whatever your synthetic you're using are, I'm going to pull that over the top, put a couple of wraps in front, a couple over the top, and then clip off that tag. And then I'm just going to clean that up a little bit and put in a nice thread head on there. Throw in some quick finishes. Clip that off. And then depending on how long the uh, CDC fibers are, sometimes I'll come in and give this a little haircut because sometimes you'll have fibers on there that are an inch long or something. Um, and so I just clean it up a little bit. And then a little head cement on those thread wraps. And that's all there is to the burrowing mayfly. And you can see you can you can kind of kind of move those maneuver those tails around, but they're going to flow in the water as they go around. Any questions? No, that's great. Okay. I've played with that little clamp before. You make it look so easy that that clamp is challenging the first time. I, I may have done that more than once. Yes. Uh, but I, I really do. I, I find myself using this CDC clamp all the time for gathering up materials and stuff. So. Well, that's so much easier than a pedagogical clamp. I've never seen that. That's, that's, that is so much easier than a pedagogical clamp. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a lot easier. And I've actually done this before. Um, if you remember, I, when, when we were in school, we called them bulldog clamps. And you can still buy these from like Office Depot and stuff. And they have a, a metal cylinder. And then it has two metal plates that come through it that come back to handles. And when you squeeze this thing, it opens up those metal plates. They actually work quite effectively in their I don't think you can buy singles of them, but you can get a pack of five of them for, you know, under twenty dollars. So you, there's multiple ways you can go about this, but I, I definitely have fallen in love with the way the CDC clamp works. Jim, do you have a question? Yeah. Does that come in different color variations? Yeah, I, I tie it in all kinds of color variations. As a matter of fact, the set that I sent around had. I think red, I think it had an orange, it has a green, so yeah, I tie it and, it, and it's, you know, you want to do some matching of the hatch. If you've got nymph patterns that are coming off and are black, tie it in black. Have you, from your experience, do you think color is, a very, is just as critical as size? I think the pattern is much more critical than the color. Do, do I think sometimes color absolutely makes a difference and they're going to refuse it if it's the wrong color? Yeah, but I think more times if you've got the shape right, because a lot of times, especially in our waters that we fish, they're so turbid yeah. that all they're seeing is a shadow. And so, you know, probably in a lot of the chocolate waters that we fish, four inches away, they can't tell what color it is anyway. Although, you know, the old saying, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. <laughs> so, okay, anybody else have any questions? I do have um, recipes up here and pictures of it. I've got, I, I apologize, I only printed about 20 of them, but you're welcome to take those. And if you don't get one, uh, I've got my cards up here. Just drop me an email and I'll be glad to send you 